Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Oliver Upton. I'm a uh, software engineer at Google. Um, I've been working on KVM for the past few years uh, in support of Google Cloud. And today, I'd like to share with you some of the work that my team has done uh, for scaling KVM on ARM. So first, oh, just a second here. first, a quick introduction. So uh, Google Cloud recently announced um, the T2A family of uh, virtual machines, which is actually its first offering built on the ARM architecture. Um, the product is currently in uh, public preview, um, and it's built using the Ampere Ultra SoC. Uh, similar to our x86-based offerings, uh, we're using a KVM-based virtualization stack. Um, but um, one decision that we made uh, is using a new kernel, the so-called uh, Icebreaker kernel, uh, which was presented last year by some of my colleagues at Google. Um, it is intended to be a close to upstream uh, kernel for use in uh, Google production workloads. And uh, we chose to use that for uh, T2A in order to stay as close as possible with upstream and focus the majority of our engineering efforts on upstream. So on to today's topic. Uh, in order to prepare for uh, running virtual machines on ARM, we spent some time trying to scale the ARM port of KVM uh, and at least test it out. And uh, it turns out that it actually runs quite well in steady state, but uh, we found a rather familiar problem, which was dirty tracking. Uh, we noticed that uh, we had a lot of MMU lock contention um, when we enabled dirty logging for pre-copy. So that's uh, we actually need to do write protection for dirty logging. Uh, there's no uh, alternative such as Intel's PML on ARM. So actually, we were taking a very high frequency of stage two aborts at the beginning of pre-copy. And uh, the dirty tracking state is uh, always measured at uh, PTE granularity, uh, which will be relevant here uh, in a little bit. So uh, in order to really characterize the worst case uh, scenario we have here, uh, we built a, a test workload. Um, so we chose our largest VM, which is a 48 vCPU VM with 192 gigs of RAM. And uh, we backed that with a uh, 2 meg huge TLB. Um, and we put a, a user space in it that effectively uh, runs a uh, simple th uh, thread on all the cores, which is trying to do as many writes as possible to memory, striding per uh, page size granularity. Uh, so we first allow it to uh, pre-populate the memory, and then after some time, when it reaches steady state, we enable dirty logging, and we measure how quickly the guest can still uh, continue to dirty memory. So when we were running on the initial kernel, we saw something that wasn't quite so live for live migration. Um, we saw a rather significant degradation in performance when we enabled dirty logging um, on the order of around 99%. Uh, this, of course, was rather unfortunate, and even worse yet, uh, it, the blackout period, well, you couldn't call it a uh, blackout, but really the brownout period was uh, around 30 seconds. Uh, so effectively, we killed the VM. So, of course, when we looked under the hood, we saw a familiar problem. Much like on x86, we saw something that looked like a lock contention on the MMU lock. Um, at least initially on ARM, uh, the MMU was protected with a spin lock. Um, and then when uh, dirty logging is enabled, uh, we actually split the pages uh, lazily. So rather than doing an eager page split where we shatter all of guest memory down to 4K at the beginning of dirty logging, we're doing it in the vCPU fault path. So naturally, we went about fixing a similar problem with a similar solution. So we took a stab at trying to protect the ARM MMU with a read-write lock. So in 5.18, uh, we actually made the switch over to using a read-write lock for uh, KVM on ARM. Um, however, the only thing that we put on the read side was the write uh, unprotect path. So that's when we take a uh, write fault and we're preparing to mark it as writable and mark the page as dirty. Um, but that actually didn't do anything for uh, the page split path. Um, and then something that's on the mailing list right now, um, we actually applied uh, the uh, read side faults for the rest of the stage two aborts. Um, so this was actually handling um, mapping memory and remapping, so the case of a page split or a page collapse. Uh, so that actually, that series looks rather uh, similar to the TDP MMU on x86. We uh, protected the uh, page tables with RCU uh, and then only freed them in an RCU grace period. Um, unfortunately, because of the uh, architecture of KVM on ARM, um, the page table code is actually used twice. It's used both in the kernel 
as well as in the NVHE low visor. So um, a lot of care had to go into actually isolating the RCU references to just the kernel side because RCU is not available in NVHE. So with that, we went ahead and reran our test workload and we actually saw some signs of life. Uh, so here you can see that when we uh, originally had a 30% or excuse me, a, a 30 second degradation of guest <coughs> performance, we're seeing just around three to six seconds. However, that massive cliff is still unacceptable. Um, and just as a heads up with these uh, uh, graphs, um, the purple side is going to be on the source uh, machine and the green side is actually on the target machine. So we were still seeing a, a lot of uh, degradation at the beginning of dirty logging and it wasn't entirely clear why. So after poking around a little bit in the kernel and looking at some traces, it looked like we were spending an inordinate amount of time uh, doing TLB invalidations. So we uh, started picking away at this and trying to understand what was going on. Um, it didn't appear that there was any software locking. Um, so what the heck's going on? Um, we actually have to call this in the middle of a page split because of the break before make requirements of the RM architecture. Um, and I'll go over that uh, right now because it's actually a little bit different from x86. So break before make. Uh, the ARM architecture is extremely prescriptive about how software can manipulate the page tables. This is unlike x86 where it's a bit more free what we can do. Um, and effectively, under certain conditions, software must first invalidate a PTE, so clearing it um, and making sure that's visible to hardware before then again installing a visible PTE. So uh, in the case of a page split, we can't directly jump from a huge page down to a table. We actually have to go through an intermediate step of zeroing it and then also invalidating the TLDs. Um, effectively, this has the result of preventing TLD conflicts because at no point in time are two different values for the PTE visible to hardware in a system. Um, and as I said, it's actually required for huge page splitting. So what does that sequence look like? So let's assume that uh, we took a fault on a two meg uh, block or huge page here, and we're getting ready to split it down to 4K for dirty logging. So the first step that we actually have to do is we have to zero the PTE. And then we use a DSB or a, a serialization barrier uh, to ensure that after that instruction retires that the zero value of the PTE is visible uh, within the inner shareable domain of the system. And then after that, we go ahead and uh, flush the stage two uh, so we can do an IPA based uh, TLB invalidation um, and we uh, flush any of the stage two entries that might exist in a, a TLB. Um, and we also use a DSB here to make sure that that um, is has completed throughout the system before moving on to the next part, which is another annoying caveat, which is that we also have to explicitly flush the combined stage one and stage two uh, uh, TLB entries. Um, so even before the uh, stage two is invalidated, it's possible that those entries were used to then fill a combined uh, TLB entry. So if we were to actually resume um, immediately after doing the first invalidation, we could actually see TLB conflicts. Then finally, we have to serialize the instruction pipeline and write the new value. So we write in the table, we install a page, and wire up the guests and get it running again. So what are some of the side effects that we notice from break before make? So uh, the TLB invalidations we're broadcasting on the inner shareable domain. This is something that we just do in Linux whenever uh, manipulating the page tables. Uh, we don't focus on uh, outer shareable or system-wide uh, TLB invalidations. Um, and then the DSB instruction is actually where we feel a lot of the pain. So the DSB instruction is going to wait for all in-flight invalidations in a certain uh, shareability domain. So in the case of inner shareable, we're going to be waiting on other vCPU threads perhaps that are doing TLB invalidations. So then the observation is that on a fully loaded system, so let's say a 48 vCPU VM, where all 48 of those vCPUs are faulting, doing TLB invalidations, and finally resuming the guest, we see that that sequence took an upwards of several milliseconds for a single vCPU to complete. So the result is absolutely unacceptable vCPU latency. So then naturally the next question <laughs> comes up of, well, what happens if I just skip it? Um, and actually it's uh, implementation specific, what could happen, and none of them are fun. Uh, the first case is that the hardware is polite and it informs you that it found a TLB conflict and it gives you a TLB conflict abort. Um, in the base architecture, it's not 
uh, entirely clear whether or not that's going to go to EL1 or EL2, so EL1 being the guest or EL2 being the host. And uh, in this case, there's not a whole lot we can do other than flush all the TLDs. But more uh, terrifying is what happens if the TLD returns one of the two valid mappings or possibly an amalgamation of the two TLD entries. Um, so uh, if that's not enough to scare you, the ARM ARM actually goes a bit further and informs you that it's open season for all kinds of fun things to happen, such as breaking the architectural guarantees of coherency, single copy atomicity, and uh, ordering of the memory model. So then, if we can't get rid of them, we have to find a way to minimize the pain on the guest. So um, the first one's pretty easy. We had to look for ways that we could get rid of unnecessary uh, broadcasting of uh, TLB invalidations. And one of the areas where KVM was originally doing uh, TLB invalidations uh, in a broadcasted manner was for uh, write unprotect or relaxing the permissions on a PTE. Uh, this is actually not necessary. We don't have to broadcast in this case. We can just do a local TLB flush. Uh, so we actually applied a patch for this, and we did see a pretty decent uplift from that. Um, and then beyond that, we had to find some way to get around the unavoidable TLD invalidation. So for every huge page, we will have to pay the cost of a break before make. We just would like to do it somewhere other than in the VCFU fault path. So um, the first implementation might look something like uh, eager page splitting, like we, what we do on x86, where as soon as uh, dirty logging is enabled on a mem slot, we shatter all of the uh, huge pages down to 4K granularity. However, this actually has a similar problem because we then, again, will saturate with a bunch of TLB invalidations and effectively stall the guest until we're done. So we had to look for a way to spread it out. And actually what we did is we took advantage of the uh, manual uh, dirty log protection. Uh, so we actually used the KVM clear dirty log ioctal to allow user space to rate limit um, how we do uh, page splits. So when user space uh, issues the clear uh, dirty log ioctal, we only split that range of pages, and then it's up to user space to decide how much time to wait in between. So with that, we actually experimented quite a bit, and we come up with something that looked a lot more like this. So uh, with the user space controls to throttle dirty logging, uh, we were able to minimize the break before make overhead, so we actually spread out the uh, TLB invalidations over a period of time. And we see a much more gradual and steady degradation of guest performance, no huge cliffs, and certainly nowhere near as significant of a drop. So then, what's next? Um, there's a lot of things that are coming in the ARM architecture that could be promising. Um, so really, we would like to have hardware fix this. This is something that we don't want to be dealing with in software. Um, so uh, as far as in the integration of a system, it could be that an interconnect could Im implement uh, TLB snoop filters to help uh, complete TLB invalidations at a, uh, in a quicker amount of time. Um, and then on top of that, there's some cool uh, extensions coming to the core architecture as well. So uh, TLBI range instructions are a feature of the later ARM architecture, which allows software to invalidate a range of memory instead of a s uh, specific page or granule of memory. Um, so we can actually um, batch up TLB invalidations without doing a global flush. Um, and then on top of that, we have uh, what's called level two break before make support. So uh, later revisions of the architecture relax some of those break before make requirements and allow software to do more things without doing the invalidations in between. Um, so most importantly to us in KVM, level two break before make means that we don't actually have to do an invalidation in the middle of a huge page split or a uh, table collapse. So in this case, um, there is one bit of a snag, uh, which is that software actually has to deal with TLB conflict aborts. This is something that we don't do currently in KVM. Um, and when that happens, our only option is really to just do a global flush anyhow. So um, there will need to be some care in how exactly we apply that. And when we do, uh, we might need to do TLB invalidations in between uh, to um, avoid the likelihood of a TLB conflict abort. On top of that, I would like to give some acknowledgments to some of the folks on my team. Uh, as I mentioned, this was a team effort. Um, and uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank Ricardo Kohler for uh, implementing the eager page flip mechanism. So uh, he did the, uh, the clear IOCL implementation. Uh, thank you, David Matlack, who we'll be hearing from uh, in the next talk. Uh, he actually gave the suggestion for using uh, manual uh, dirty log protection uh, to do the uh, page split uh, rate limiting. 
Uh, thank you, Mark Zanger, uh, for the uh, patch that we stole from you for uh, non-shareable TOP invalidations. Uh, turns out it works. Thank you. <laughs> and then also thank you, Jing Zhang, uh, from uh, Google as well um, for upstreaming the uh, parallel write on protection path. And then with that, um, are there any questions? Mark? I think I'm going to go ahead and repeat the questions. Okay. Yeah. One more? Back more? No, no, forward. Forward, okay. Forward, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, I don't fully get why what CLD ran you stole, because you still, although that you stole something at phase two, but you still need a full validation for phase one. Right. So do you actually gain? So you gain the fact that you can, was that? Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> so uh, Mark asks whether or not uh, the TLBI range instructions actually give us anything for uh, improving the pain that we see from TLB invalidations. And I think so, uh, that the answer is yes, but it has to come with both break before make and the TLBI range. So we can actually do a set of operations and then um, in between we can do a TLBI range so we can flush that batch size that we did. Yes, we still have to flush the combined mappings, but there's a high likelihood that we left behind some stage two uh, entries in the TLB as well. Uh, I have another question, which is not directly related to this work, but has this kind of problem been reported to implementers and also to ARM so that there is some quality requirements put into the architecture? Because it looks to me like it's not necessarily that the architecture is, is doing the wrong thing, but the implementation is actually not straight enough. So Mark's second question was whether or not um, there's any feedback that's been going to ARM or to implementers of ARM uh, with regards to this problem and if there's any considerations for fixing it. And um, as far as I know, um, I would hope, but I, I can't really speak definitively for what folks are saying, but this is something that we really should uh, be noisy about uh, in the hopes of getting some answers. Yes. So in that case, uh, we wouldn't actually, uh, uh, yes, so the, the question was, uh, if we have something like Intel's PML, um, is that going to improve the situation? And I, again, I, th I think so. So the reason that we have to do these TLB invalidations is um, at least for uh, write on protection, we would prefer to not take the fault. Um, and there is still some cost associated with a non-broadcasted TLB invalidation. It doesn't solve the problem of uh, break before make. Um, that uh, in particular, has to come from better implementations, um, but yeah. Are you implementing? Do you have all of this? Or do you need anything more? <sighs> we'll see. Because <laughs> I, 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 again, it's uh, the problem comes down to integration. And it, it, hopefully, um, with all three of these, you see something that works. But who knows? Yes. Right, uh, so Will is asking if uh, we considered using VMIDs to um, have a separate VMID for the uh, dirty logging phase where we map at 4K and another one for the highest granularity. So we hadn't considered that yet, um, but that certainly sounds like a good option to maybe at least research. Any other questions? So David's asking whether or not the architecture clarifies um, who gets the TLB conflict abort uh, with level two break before make, and it is EL2. Uh, so KVM will get to handle the TLB conflict. Anything else? No? Awesome, thank you.